Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Gardening on the Gulf Coast. Gardening on the Gulf Coast is a program that's being brought to you by our co cohorts up and down the coast. Horticulture agents that are here to provide quality gardening information, horticultural related information that will help you improve your skills and your quality of life. Today's session is designed to provide an opportunity for you to ask questions of our agents. We consider this an ask an agent round table. And we have several agents that are available to help answer some questions that you may have been considering in your gardening experience. On tap, we've got uh, several folks. Uh, Boone Holiday. Boone is horticulture agent, Fort Bend County. Kevin Gibbs. Kevin is uh, the uh, horticulture agent in Hey Boone. How are you doing? Excellent. Kevin Gibbs is the horticulture agent in Nueces County. Ginger Easton Smith is the Ag and Natural Resources agent, but an outstanding horticulturist that is serving our community in Aransas County. And I'm Stephen Brugerhoff, horticulture agent in Galveston County. We're here to help serve you uh, and, and meet your needs as well. We had a roundtable session a couple of months ago. We thought it was fairly successful. Uh, and oftentimes we feel that uh, the best way to start any kind of discussion or conversation is for us to kind of prime the pump is, if you will, to lead the conversation by asking a question or offering uh, current topics that we encounter on a weekly basis. Now, before we start the program today, just a, a little bit of guidance for you as a viewer. We ask that unless prompted that you keep your microphone muted, but more importantly that you keep your video muted. In other words, keep your camera turned off. Uh, it allows for a smooth transmission of the broadcast that we're experiencing today. The programs have been recorded. We've been a little bit lax in getting them up to a YouTube channel, but we're looking into that so that you can go back and review some of the uh, programs that we've been providing to you over the past two years. So I guess I will we'll, um, ask our agents to turn on their mics and introduce yourself, but um, if y'all can think of a topic we can lead this discussion with, Well, I'm Ginger Easton Smith, um, as Stephen said, in Aransas County. And the topic I think we that might be good for today would be watering, especially of grass, but watering in general. I, I can say more now or I can wait till people introduce themselves. Kevin, go ahead and introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kevin Gibbs in Nueces County, and I, I think watering would be a great topic to start with, Ginger. Excellent. And Boone? Water, water, water. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But not every day, right? <laughs> you, you do have a question already in the chat, so. All right. Yep. Folks, I'll be monitoring the chat and seeing if I can tease something out there. We have a, a participant named Lisa. She says she's purchased a three acre cleared lot in northwest Montgomery County and mow the weeds regularly. She's asking what grass, seed or plug could I introduce that would over time take over and make an acceptable lawn grass that doesn't require irrigation? I'm thinking of Bermuda type, but what type? I'll, I'll take a go at it. Um, and we, we get this quite a bit, and I, I think that there's there's a couple misconceptions, particularly when um, homeowners go to the garden centers and, and even on t uh, TV commercials right now, you'll see um, advertisements on seed to fill in areas in the yard. Um, but the, the, the trick for us is that most of those blends of grass seed are going to be mixtures of fescue, um, sometimes Bermuda, uh, but rye, either annual or perennial rye, that are cool season grasses, cool weather grasses, and and not not going to perform well for us. And even Bermuda grass seed, which is the only warm season turf grass that we can grow from seed uh, effectively in our landscape, it's quite difficult um, to get a good stand of grass to grow from seed. Uh, one is because of uh, our inconsistencies of moisture 
when we start trying to put that seed bed down this time of year, we have to keep that that first inch of soil just just slightly moist through that seed germination process so that those plants can get established. And um, we don't get that. We it's either you know blazing hot, windy, bone dry, or we're getting you know monsoon rains, you know four or five inches of rain within a couple hours. And the majority of that grass seed is all buckled up in the corner of the yard or down towards the gutter um, in the street. Um, so, you know, we, you kind of have to weigh out the consequence versus the ease of just going with sod grass. Uh, if you're in Montgomery County, uh, you probably have some trees. Uh, even if that lot there has been clear cut, there's going to be some large trees growing on the periphery. And at some point, I imagine that you're going to plant some trees. And in San Augustine, it's just not, I mean, uh, Bermuda is just not a grass that can tolerate shade at all. Uh, our best option for that is San Augustine. But unfortunately, the only real effective way to establish San Augustine grass is by sod, full sod application. And that's not uh, being with the sod pieces. You see a lot of like these checkerboard things where you know they try to displace the pieces of sod randomly so that they, they'll eventually migrate together. Uh, that just doesn't work. Um, the main reason is those bare areas we're either losing the topsoil uh, with rainfall uh, or we're getting a lot of weeds growing in those void areas in between the sod pieces. So really the best the best way, I mean you're biting the cost up front by buying sod. And putting it down, you know, full mat, piece to piece across the area, uh, but you'll you'll be reimbursed in the long run uh, by having something that can maintain um, on its own without a whole lot of care. You won't have to come back and do a whole lot of weeding uh, in between those pieces. Um, it's really just the way to go. So plugs, you know, plugs are good if you're just trying to repair certain areas in the yard. If you've got some 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 small uh, areas that the grass is just not growing well, uh, but it's really just not it's not a functional option for establishing a new lawn area. Um, but if you if you are going to go with seed, uh, based off of the question, is three three acres. So yeah, that's uh, that would be a lost sod. So I think you would prioritize the sod around the important spots. Okay, so if you're building the house. You know, you put the sod, you know, the front view along the driveway and, and walkway areas, uh, usable space close up in the landscape, and then any of the areas away from the infrastructure that are lower maintenance, you could you could probably put some seed out, some Bermuda grass seed, uh, but then, you know, timing uh, of that and establishment of that is is pretty crucial. Uh, it's not something that you just throw seed on and walk away and expect that it's going to be successful. Anybody else want to chime in on trying to direct seed the turf grass? Well, not on direct seeding so much. I And I certainly agree with what you're saying about the sod and concentrating it around uh, certain areas. But I'm also wondering about, you say you're mowing the weeds. Um, is that maybe an acceptable option just to keep doing that and a large part of it and put sod in small areas? Yeah, and I think you could, you know, even if you if you overseed it a little bit in mm -hmm. this uh, this vegetative mat area, you know, I just I call it green stuff that when you mow it, it, it looks flat and green and fairly uniform. Um, and that that's that's realistic. You know, I, I think it's kind of funny if if you took most of the horticulturists across the state and and took people to their home landscapes, I think they'd find a lot of just mowed green stuff <laughs> instead of a, a, a manicured uh, turf because it, it you know it's a lot of maintenance to to have a you know uniform uh, monoculture. Uh, turf situation so prioritizing that look right in those prime time spots in the landscape I think maybe that's the way to go 
Excellent. Thank you, uh, Boone, for answering. Um, answering Lisa's question uh, and uh, of course when you're putting down sod or or uh, it's very very important to make sure you, that you stitch that material together that you make sure it's end to end and that you water it until it uh, until the roots be, become established or until you get root establishment um, now ginger had uh, mentioned uh, water conservation of course we're looking forward to that when we're talking about Lawns, uh, Ginger, do you have a uh, recommendation for weekly uh, watering, especially during the uh, summer months? Well, that is my recommendation, actually, that people water once a week at a maximum. Um, at this time of year, when it's so hot and dry and it's been so windy, there's a tendency, especially now, to water frequently. But it's really better for the grass to water deeply and infrequently. And there's no established grass just does not need to be watered any more than once a week. Um, at my house, it's lucky if it gets watered um, once a month, sort of like going along with what Boone was saying about you, you look at horticulturalist lawn and they're not certainly not perfect, but mine is green, um, not a lot of weeds. Um, not real green when it's dry, but it comes back green when we get rain or when I water it. Um, but I think the frequent watering leads to a number of problems. One is shallow rooting, which then makes the grass less drought tolerant. Um, same with trees and shrubs. Um, deep rooting is what you want to go for, and the only way you're going to get deep rooting is by deep watering. So water deeply and infrequently. If you can't get your inch of water on your turf grass in one application, then you might have to cycle it. So you you set your irrigation to water until you start seeing uh, a little bit of runoff, and then you stop it. You maybe wait several hours or possibly till the next day, and then you water again for that same amount of time that took for it to get to runoff until you've applied your, your inch of water. But another problem is uh, diseases, especially take all root rot. Um, most most fungi, including the one that caused take all root rot, they love wet weather or wet conditions, moist conditions. So frequent watering just sets up an environment that that fungus needs to establish. So um, less frequent watering will likely prevent a lot of problems. And we certainly need to think about water conservation every day. Oh, yes, especially going into drought like conditions, depending on where you're at in the state. Yes. And we, we did have as far as resources that we can point folks to, uh, of course, uh, Aggie Turf does have uh, various uh, publications that address lawn management and maintenance from their website, and I posted that in the chat uh, box here. Irrigation uh, is related to your circumstance where you're at. Uh, Ginger has provided uh, definitely sound advice as a general rule of thumb as we're moving into a hotter part of the year, especially really depending on where you're you're at and the kind of um, the kind of pathogens that are present uh, in in our local environment. Uh, one person in relation to the, to the earlier discussion had mentioned uh, for the uh, for Lisa that had uh, requested information about establishing a lawn uh, or more grass in a three acre lot. Uh, someone had suggested Jean had suggested a wildflower field. So I, I have something I'd like to add to that. If you're considering if you're trying to establish grass, of course, that's that's one issue. It depends on your aesthetic trying to stop trying to include additional plants or more biodiversity in that environment. If you're looking at a field of blue bonnets per se, if you're thinking along those those lines, you're going to want to create spaces that kind of circumvents what we're trying to establish uh, establishing a lawn. When we are establishing a lawn, you can uh, put in um, if it, it depends on what your aesthetic and your end end goal is. If it's replicating a prairie, there are mix, mixtures of native short, uh, warm season, short stature grasses, certainly that you can incorporate. 
If you're talking about an actual lawn, that's a monocrop. If you're thinking about establishing or spreading out wildflower seeds in the meantime, again, it depends on what context and design or end goal you're looking at. If you're thinking about ex establishing a prairie look, um, again, consider a mixture of, of short season grasses. You can, uh, you can begin to cultivate uh, by seed. If you're thinking about a lawn, I would not suggest tossing out uh, wildflower seeds to occupy that space. Again, you're kind of working against purposes. So think about the end goals and what you're trying to achieve uh, for that uh, for that um, that piece of land. Now, we, as far as water goes, um, do uh, any of my colleagues, do you all have a resource that we would go to that uh, AgriLife Extension does offer that focuses on water in general? There's an app called Water My Lawn um, that takes into account your um, your location, what the evaporation coefficient is, and all that kind of stuff. I think I can. I think I can find it, but another thing about watering is. I would recommend that you you do water your trees, especially, but maybe also your shrubs right now. Um, and the trees, if you give them a really thorough watering, which is going to be several hundred gallons of water, they would probably be good for three to four weeks. You know, if we don't get rain. Hopefully we'll get rain. Ginger, let's talk about about where and how they should be watering their trees, because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about how how and, and where uh, you should be putting the water. Good idea. You want to go into that, Kevin? Um, I can talk about it a, a little bit and then you can add whatever you think. You know, I get a lot of phone calls from folks and they say, well, I, I've been watering, but they laid the water hose or whatever the sprinkler down right at the trunk of the tree. and and that's just not where they need to be watering. They need, need to be watering out where those feeder roots are at. And so uh, I always tell people find the edge of the canopy and that's where your feeder roots are at is out in that area. And that's where you should be watering. And and similar to to how you're talking about watering lawns, uh, a good infrequent soaking of a tree or a shrub is way better than than standing out there with the water hose and watering a little bit every day. It, it just doesn't uh, establish good deep roots. So. Um, Either one, any of y'all have anything else you'd like to add? And I also think I also think that um, that there's a, a myth that that large trees don't need watering, that they have access, their roots can find the water without any problem, and that they that their roots are so deep that they work their way down to the water table, and and that's not true either. They they need um, watering at least you know once a week once every two weeks just like anything else does mm -hmm. yeah and the, and the, <clears throat> the the water penetration on established trees particularly when we get into droughty situations where the the, the surface soil uh, is compact uh, to get hydration down within that first one foot uh, depth of, of soil where the fibrous roots of these trees are it uh, goes back to uh, Ginger's point on the, the cycle and soak or repetitive cycling, um, because if you've got any topography to your landscape uh, to deliver the amount of water that those trees need, um, you, you're you going to have to do it uh, in repetition. So it would be to, if you've got one large tree is uh, running the uh, sprinkler out there for about five minutes, and that's if you've got a, you know, a loamy clay topsoil, that's about, you know, 10, 10 minutes into water and you're going to have surface runoff. Um, so cut that off, move it over to another tree, run it, and then go back to that, that first tree after you cycle through the rest of them and, and apply another run of, of water on there. And, and really the, <clears throat> the Aggie engineered uh, technique there would be, you know, if we're droughty, and you have a hard surface soil, uh, take you a big screwdriver out with you. And if you can, you know, if that screwdriver, the blade on that is, is 10 inches long and you can penetrate that all the way down into the soil 
then you've you've reached a, a pretty good depth as far as the moisture needs of those those roots on the trees. If you put it down, it only goes two or three inches, then you know that's as far as that water has penetrated, and you have to keep going because there is a you know side effect to light mo uh, moisture applications of uh, uh, turf. Definitely, but really with trees for sure, is that if we're if we're trying to help the tree through drought periods and we're only watering the first two inches of depth of soil, um, we're, we're encouraging those feeder roots, the fibrous roots to move, to migrate up towards the surface uh, to capture that moisture instead of, instead of encouraging the roots to go down deeper where there may be more of a bank of, of moisture more readily available for the trees. So by, um, by watering less, and more frequently, we could be actually causing stress to the trees. Great information. We've, we've got somebody talking about root suckers on a tree. They want to know how to get rid of them, and it's not an easy answer. So um, I generally tell people there there's not not really a good way to get rid of them. In fact, that they're putting their trees at risk if if they spray anything on them. So. Uh, what are your suggestions? What are your thoughts on this? Just mowing them or cutting them. Yeah, depending on where they're at, um, it, you know, it's quite difficult if they are coming up in the lawn. Um, <clears throat> you know, a little surgery on those if you can dig down to where those root sprouts are coming and and try to um, remove it as low as possible. Because if you just if you're just cutting it off at the ground surface, this is going to continue to come back. But if you can excavate down to where it's originating from the uh, lateral root of the tree uh, and then bury that back up, a lot of times it will heal over and, and it won't be a problem anymore. Um, in flower beds, same thing as digging that down and trying to see where it's coming from the laterals. Um, but th what you can do in, uh, in a flower bed or a mulch beds area is after you've removed those shoots you can cover that up with a couple layers of cardboard and then put put mulch back over that and that's going to confuse the tree but there's going to be no uh, sunlight directional sunlight exposure and uh, decrease the oxygen and so those those sprouts will will minimize uh, with that technique um, there are some products or some hormone products that are on the market. Um, we've tried them with several trees with mixed results uh, that basically uh, inhibit uh, the, the development of uh, root sprouts, but you have to, you don't just spray it on the sprout. You actually have to excavate it the same way, cut it off and then apply this, this uh, spray uh, directly to those, those wounds to discourage the further uh, development of sprouting in those areas. Um, I don't think those products are harmful. Basically, they're just growth hormones um, um, or, or inhibitors. Uh, so it's not like a herbicide. I would not use any type of a, a weed killer, a herbicide uh, as a way to control root sprouts because uh, the vast majority of the herbicides are systemic. And so that will translocate into the the root system of the tree and cause uh, a range of harm uh, to those established trees. I think it's important here to say too that that they need to make sure that it actually is root sprouts and not that they're coming up from acorns or, or something. So uh, and and it, I've noticed when we have shallow roots that we have more of a tendency for this to happen. So that's uh, even more of a reason to make sure that you water correctly when the trees are young so that those roots establish deeper. I, I definitely would not recommend letting those sprouts grow up. I went to this property once in, uh, in the valley where they had let you know, come up to the property and there's this beautiful dark green hedge, which looked really nice. And then as we got closer, we realized it was all oak seedlings and it looked fine. But, you know, as those grow and get larger in girth, it was going to be a, a nightmare, I think, to 
to cut that down. A boon, you're yeah, the acorn mats are, are, are pretty difficult. Um, because a lot of times as, as you know, if they're if they're two years old uh, and they the, the trunk has any type of a, a girth to it, even pencil thickness, um, the, the roots of the oaks will graft together uh, in an area. And so, you know, even if it's a, since that's a different plant, a seedling plant in an area, and I've seen some really thick ground covers like that as well. Uh, those roots are are all kind of uh, grafted together. So again, herbicide uh, to control those is not going to be a good uh, answer because you are you're going to cause some secondary impacts to the to the mother tree there. Um, a good pair of pliers, good strong uh, pliers, um, and just grabbing that that young stem as low as you can and putting putting a little muscle into it lifting that straight up a lot of times those acorn seedlings will will come up especially if you if you water that area thoroughly uh the night before um loosen up that that's the soil surface and uh and use some uh pliers to hold on to grasp onto the young tree to be able to pull it up if you're just using gloves and you pull up on those young trees a lot of times you'll you'll just pull all the, the cambium uh, off of the, the young trunk. And so there'll just be this little wiry little um, pith core sticking out of the ground and you really haven't accomplished anything. But I've, I have found that if you can get a good grip on it uh, and then migrate it up, uh, those young ones will come out. If, they're, if they've been mowing them for three or four years, they're not gonna come out like that. You're gonna have to probably dig them out uh, very methodically. You don't want to go in there with a, um, you know, a rotary tiller or something like that and, and try to work underneath the root zone of that, the mother tree. Um, you're going to, you're going to do a lot of harm to the, the root system uh, of your established tree. Uh, so you either have to rub them out with a sharpshooter or a hori hori is a, a hard uh, gardening spade. Uh, that works pretty good for something like this, where you can dig down deep and kind of pry up the root system of those young trees to lift them up out of the ground. But unfortunately, um, if there's a lot of them, I think it's going to be a, a, a couple days worth of work for you. Um, again, uh, making the job easier would be the, the day before is um, saturating that soil in there thoroughly so that they're easier to, to dislodge. I like that idea about the pliers. The other thing that you know we get a lot of calls on is, is soil erosion um, in established areas, particularly with live oak trees and the turf grass has diminished because of the shade. Just with uh, with rain and, and wind, we've lost some topsoil. And so you're starting to see some of those laterals uh, rise up to the surface. And the questions are, um, what can we do about those exposed uh, lateral roots on, on the established trees? All right, one thing that we um, have not addressed, and I, this doesn't uh, veer too far from the current discussion. Of course, when we're establishing trees, planting trees really should be done either later in the year or earlier in the year, of course. But um, uh, one thing we often talk about is mulching. For a mature established tree, it may not be practical for the homeowner to establish that, especially if you're cultivating a lawn. Um, typically, when we do mulch, we've got a little donut that we uh, put around the tree itself. In my experience, oftentimes, you know, the lawn itself provides that cover and, to, and helps to reduce incidences of erosion. If you're in a typical urban, um, if you're a, if you're a homeowner in the uh, city or even in the in the country, if you're in, in a city, you know, oftentimes you're going to have a little posted stamp of a lawn. And again, the lawn itself is is going to take care of those uh, those needs uh, regarding you know regarding soil erosion. So our practice for mulching, there is a practical end to it, but also 
more of an aesthetic one that I think that we've uh, we've um, ad adopted or accepted as a culture, right? So um, when we do mulch, um, of course, think about the uh, underground, how those uh, roots are coursing through that underground environment. They're cruising out well beyond the can the canopy of the tree itself. You know, if you're going to mulch, you might consider pulling it out at least, uh, you know, trying to uh, drag it out at least underneath the uh, canopy of the tree, again, depending on your circumstance and how much light penetration you've got below that um, that tree. Um, does anyone uh, does any one of my colleagues have any have any um, recommendations for mulching in general for established trees for younger ones? Certainly, but for established trees, more mature trees. Well, first, keep it off the trunk. Uh, don't be a volcano mulcher. Don't pile it on the trunk. It should never mulch should never touch the trunk because it will cause rotting. So I would say mulch starting about on an established tree a foot or two out, depending on the size of the tree. And then, as Stephen said, just mulch out as far as you can. Um, it's the only advice I have. And mulch in your containers too. I, I think mulching. I think mulching is a great idea because I think uh, one of the problems that we have with with trees is that people hit them with weed eaters, and uh, by applying mulch, then uh, you eliminate the need to have to go up weed eating around the the tree trunk. So I, I think it's also great for that. We had a question about watering fruit trees um, in seven to ten gallon pots. How often to water them? And it does, I'm assuming they're in full sun and that it's hot where you are. Um, good guess there. I would say probably every maybe four or five days, um, especially the sugar apple, citrus can probably go a little longer. But if they're developing their fruit, you want to, you don't want them to get water stressed at all. During other times of the year, it's, it's okay if they get a little stressed. Um, it actually might help initiate flowering, but um, once the fruit, once they've started flowering, the fruit is setting, you want to keep it fairly moist. So you are going to have to experiment, you know, poke your finger down in the soil and see, um, see when it's dry and then set your schedule from that. Use your digital moisture meter right here. Stick your finger down in the pot or stick it down in the soil in your yard. That's really the only way to know if it's time to water. And then, you know, over time you you can develop a schedule. The hand is often the most important tool <laughs> in any kind of gardening venture. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> digit. Well, Going back to have... gardening tools, I, I, um, I, I pulled this out just so people know this is an example of a garden knife or a hori hori here. This one's from A.M. Leonard. Um, but the main thing that's important is that, you know, most of the ones you find have a, one side has a serrated edge and the other side has a sharp edge on here. And this is very uh, tempered metal, so it's very strong. And, and when you're working in, you know, dislodging uh, nut sedge out of the ground, this is this is the nut sedge tool. But trying to get young seedlings, um, we, we have a pecan orchard that, that we live on and manage. And so I, I get a lot of pecan seedlings coming up in the flower beds, and and they're one that once they 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 develop a a taproot real quick, and you can't hand pull them. So uh, a a blade like this is going to be your your answer um, moving forward. So just want to throw that in real quick. The second most important garden tool after the digital moisture meter. <laughs> Thank you, Boone. Now, we, we did have a um, a question by Janice um, focusing on her fruit trees. She says that she has white fuzzy bugs that are on my lemon trees and they're jumping off the leaves when she tries to pick them off. They seem to be leaving a powdery white trail behind them. She's wondering any ideas of what they are and what she can do to eliminate them. And um, Kevin did provide uh, a one uh, image in the chat function of what it might be. And I think that's pretty much spot on in this respect. 
proper identification of the insect will help to determine the next steps for for management of the insect. Uh, Kevin, the uh, the picture that you have up is that um, it's an Asian psyllid. There you go. So I uh, what what made me think that it might be that is when she said they're jumping off when she's trying to catch them because white flies would make kind of a they make a little kind of cloudy weird. Uh, do a strange thing. They fly off whenever you try to get them, and this one would actually hop or or uh, jump off the way that she's describing. So that's why I was wondering, and it's possible that if they are feeding on her, uh, I think it was a lemon tree. Yeah. Uh, it was citrus of some sort that that they're leaving sap behind, and and the fungus is actually growing on the sap. So um, anyway, the question she had, regardless. Uh, probably the treatment is, is going to be similar. We use horticultural oils a lot of times to, to treat these. The issue is that we cannot apply it once it starts getting hot or you take risk of burning your trees. So uh, early on in the season, uh, we do some applications of horticultural oil and in, in, in hopes of trying to uh, stave off the infestation before it ever occurs. Ginger, do you have any suggestions of what, what they can do once once they have these infestations and it's already beginning to get hot. Uh, could you use a just dishwashing liquid and water mixture, a tablespoon of dishwashing liquid, maybe to a gallon or two of water, spray it that. late in the they, day. They could probably use some liquid seven if the dishwashing mix, mixture doesn't work. I, I try to, to not go to the chemicals unless there's no other choice, but at least that one's not so severe. Or insecticidal soap. Insecticidal soap. Yeah. This, um, I, go this ahead. This time of year, probably the, the, the safer soaps are going to be your best bet if you have to do something. Now, I think that's just a, a plant hopper. So the psyllids and the plant hoppers and the leaf hoppers, they're all um, in, the, in the, the same order of insects. Um, <clears throat> and, and really, uh, in, the, in the scope, the measurement of plant damage uh, for leaf and plant hoppers, um, not really an issue. Um, so, you know, I'd put a question mark on even if we need to treat this. Um, hit them with a, a high jet uh, water uh, hose spray and to, to disband the gatherings of them. You'll see if you hit them with the, with the spray nozzle, they'll fly off in all different directions but they're more than likely they're not causing any significant damage to the tree. Now the, the picture of the psyllid here, the Asian citrus psyllid, <clears throat> yes, this insect is a vector uh, for citrus disease. So it is one that if we saw this particular insect, then we would maybe want to minimize those populations of the vector. But the white, fuzzy, uh, jumpy little guys, uh, these are plant hoppers. Um, and they're they're not really doing any significant harm. If you start seeing damage to the, the foliage of the citrus, uh, some of the sneaky ones that we'll see this time of year are the uh, swallowtail caterpillars. They call them orange dogs, and um, it looks like a pile of bird poop on the citrus leaves. And a lot of times it'll make the leaves kind of roll up, and you'll find the the young caterpillars hiding out inside the leaf and they chew the margin of the foliage. So if you see some peripheral margin damage to the leaves, then, then we're looking at um, uh, caterpillar damage. If, if you've got uh, leaves that are all really contorted uh, and kind of shriveled up and silvery looking, we would be thinking about citrus leaf miner will be a problem this this time of the year. Um, and then uh, grasshoppers, if you've got lovers real bad, usually when we get into uh, drought stress situations, we get uh, several species of uh, grasshoppers and they'll rasp holes kind of randomly on the leaf. So for some of those, you know, if we're looking at the, I guess what I'm getting at is if we're looking at the tree and you're seeing damage to the tree, then we will look at, con you know, trying to 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 remedy and manage the situation. But I, my guess is that with these plant hoppers, uh, that that they're not really causing much damage. 
Well, thanks, Stephen, for uh, for putting the the orange dog in there. It really does. The, and it's you know, Mother Nature is so cool that you know we've we've developed this larvae that that does look like a um, a, a, a wad of bird poop that's landed on the on the plant leaf to camouflage itself uh, from from predators. Pretty cool stuff. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boone and Kevin. Um, Janice continues to answer, ask questions, and that's okay. Janice, keep on filing them away. We'd love to. We'd love to help you out. Uh, Janice had asked, what kind of um, soil should she use for growing fruit trees in containers? Y'all may have already addressed that, but just tossing that back out there again. Good soil. Good soil. Well draining soil. <laughs> yes. Um, not garden soil, but potting soil. Just a, a good potting soil, and you might want to mix in some some uh, perlite with it to make it uh, have better drainage and not get compacted so quickly. I've been I've been using from my own personal experience in my backyard. Not bragging. I've got seven fig trees in containers, right? Because I've got this big fascination. I'll write a book called Fig Fascination. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm using a bagged soil that's called, uh, I'm not going to name a brand brand product, but it's called citrus soil, right? And that material dries out too quickly. Almost on a, uh, I'm looking at watering every other day. Uh, I think it has too much of a, the constituent of that, you know, of course, is some peat moss. There's a lot of sand in it. And I think that there's too much of an imbalance. It's uh, it's labeled as appropriate for citrus and um, and succulent gardens or or cactus gardens. So I think it's too well draining, and I'm having to uh, overwater those uh, containers now. You know, so um, uh, I agree with you, uh, Ginger. Looking at something with uh, that does have a, a higher uh, nutrient uh, uh, product in it. But I'm, I'm warning those folks, you know, you might want to be a little cautious if you're looking at a bag product that just advertises itself as appropriate for citrus and and um, and uh, cactus or succulents. Uh, I'm having challenges with that uh, personally. There's also a question from Lisa about um, apple trees. She's in Northwest Montgomery County, and because they have enough chill hours there, She'd like to plant a Fuji apple, um, but is asking about, does she need to plant a second Fuji? Does she need to plant another variety? Who wants yeah, to take I was, that? I was taking some notes on that one. Um, I, I hate to be the pessimist here, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, just save your money and your time and and go with some fruit species that that are notably good performers in our region. Um, we just have not found an apple that has been worth planting. We've had several different um, varieties that have kind of come on the scene and sounded really good and we trialed them and they just they just haven't done a whole lot for us. Um, there are some of the old standards that are OK. Uh, the Anna, uh, we, we trialed that a couple of years ago and it did. Moderate for one year, two years, maybe. Uh, the Carnival is another one that was touted as being, you know, semi tropical, uh, very low chill. But, you know, the problem with the apples for us is that uh, the chill <laughs> is because you know, one year we we may have 500 hours of chill, and then the next year we have zero, literally zero, uh, because of warm season interference in the middle of the winter, and and the the apples just don't will not live very long with that inconsistency of winter weather. We have some obviously with winter storm Yuri. Um, you know, we added up all that. We were like at 700 hours, 
uh, for our region, for Montgomery County, seven, eight hundred hours, which we, we never get. Um, but then you look at the years around that, we're at either zero, 200, 250, um, and all in between. So these plants, not only do they have a hard time um, getting the chill that they need, they get confused because we'll get, if we have a, a apple that's a you know 500 hour apple and we get that real early in the season, and then sometime in you know early February, it's going to start trying to flower and leaf out on us. And we're not out of winter yet. And so they get hammered and they just go downhill. So to make a short story long, um, I would say based off of our research here, that it's, it's not the best choice. Pears, otherwise, our pears are great. We've got European pears, we've got Asian pears, and we have a whole lot of really nice hybrids that have a fantastic flavor, texture, complexity to them that do fantastic. They get a little bit of fire blight on originally, but they don't die. They keep going. Um, a lot of old home sites, you know, through all East Texas along the Gulf Coast, you know, the people have been gone for 100 years. You'll find old rose, you'll find some old antique flower bulbs, and you'll find a pear tree in the yard that's that's producing fruit. And that's pretty awesome. So if they can live out in the woods, an old abandoned home site for 100 years, 75 years on their own, then I think that they're going to they're going to want to do well in a home landscape situation. So pears, I'm going to cheerlead for those all day long. Figs, there are so many different types of figs. Uh, they're the easiest thing. If we have a hard freeze, they freeze back to the ground. But the second year, they're back up and you don't even know. You can't even tell that they froze. And lots of different types of sizes, colors, textures of figs that are out there. Easy breezy. Next one is blackberries. Plenty of a couple of blackberry plants at home. There's some awesome varieties. Uh, Stephen can note on that. He's been working on some trials down at, uh, on some new releases of blackberries. They want to grow here. They love it here. They love our weather, love our soils. Um, they, they, there is some pruning that needs to be done on those to keep them going. Um, but these are examples of fruits that, that want to grow here that are going to be long lived and they're going to actually produce an abundant amount of harvest off of. So you're going to be happy with those plants. Uh, I, I don't know anybody. I've got a lot of people that have tried to grow apples and I don't know any of them that that really have anything good to say about apple production uh, in our region. Because it's just, they're just they're just too too difficult. And then the runners up for me on beyond that will be plums. Uh, peaches are not are not foolproof. There there's some issues with peaches, but we can produce them. Citrus. If we don't have winter storm Uri, we can grow all the types of citrus in our area. And there are some fantastic Asian persimmons that are fairly easy to grow. So I'd go with any of those before I would be looking at an apple. Definitely like sage it. advice. Let me get off my soapbox real quick. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, okay. Boone's spot on. There's quite a number of uh, pear varieties that are very successful here. And of course, we're we're uh, landlocked. My, my office is in Lamarck, so it's inland. It's not on the island. Um, certainly, there's a number of pear varieties that are excellent choices around here, depending on, on what you're looking at. Acres Home is a good uh, eating pear, European pear. Um, if you're looking at a canning pear, probably mm, I'm losing the name of it right now. It's a smaller one. Oh, well, anyway, there's a number that will work here. Just contact your extension agent, right? Extension agent to see what kind of fruiting trees you could cultivate successfully around your home. Folks, we're looking at about 50 minutes or it's about 1050 now. Um, would you all like to, uh, are you all available to answer maybe one or two other questions and we'll call it a day? Yes. All right. Um, one question was regarding fruit trees and container size, and I think uh, Ginger has successfully answered that. So the question was, what um, what should, uh, uh, what are the best containers for citrus and apple trees? And Ginger has responded, 
Uh, well, Ginger, you go ahead and respond, please. <laughs> I know you okay. wrote it down. Well, there was also a question about from um, someone who had purchased an apple tree in a container, an Anna, and wondered if uh, if he or she could keep it in there, keep the apple in a in the container. So I saying not indefinitely, but you know, for a few years, and of course you're going to need need to move it up um, to a larger one, and the bigger the better, really. Um, the other thing about a container is you you just want to make there the main thing is you want to make sure it has excellent drainage. Um, that is the biggest consideration. You had a question also, uh, Stephen, about whether fruit trees will survive freezes in containers. I, I think it was figs. Will figs survive freezes and containers? So I think you should answer that. Yeah, they, they certainly will. Of course, if you've got them in containers, you're going to provide some protection for them. And going back to container size, when we're looking at fruit tree production, we need to give those, those roots ample room to grow. When you buy a tree, oftentimes it's a beautiful full canopy of a tree that you're, uh, th that you're thinking about keeping it in a container. Maybe you're in a, um, in a residence where you're renting a house or you're in a place where you have limited uh, lawn space you want to keep those plants in containers um, figs can be grown successfully in uh, in containers uh, certain varieties do better there they can be kept um, cut or pruned uh, to be more dwarfed uh, violet de, violet de bordeaux is a um, is a purplish kind of fig it's a, it has a rich uh, meat to it I'm going to experiment and keep that one in a container, even though I know it, it, it can be grown more successfully in the ground. But to answer your question, I would say, you know, protect those trees as best you can. Figs in general are more temperate species. Um, they, there are certain varieties that can handle, a, that are known to handle a freeze uh, better, like Celeste um, is a variety. It's a smaller, produces a smaller fruit on it. Um, but, you know, if you get a cold enough, cold enough temps, it'll kill pretty much kill out anything. Now, the interesting thing about the figs in a demonstration garden in Brazoria County, where I was the horticulturist there, during winter storm Uri, we didn't cover any of those fig trees that were in the ground, right? So that uh, major uh, storm that we had, and we lost all top growth on, on most of those trees. They'd been in the ground for about two or three years, um, and they came they came right back and they're producing like mad this year. I, I snuck over there and, and checked it out. The plants that I have in my containers in my backyard, um, I pulled those into a into a garage during that winter storm. On an average, uh, on an average um, winter, you know, we're not we're probably not going to experience cold enough temps that would outright kill the plant in the in the container here along the Gulf Coast. I know that's a generalization, right? Um, you might uh, agree with me for those uh, for Kevin and, and Ginger that are closer down to uh, Corpus. Um, it's it's highly unlikely that that uh, you're going to have a long enough duration of a freeze that's going to outright kill that that tree in a container. Up in Montgomery County, up around Conroe, that might be a little bit of a different story. So I would suggest to go ahead and provide a little bit of uh, protection for those fig trees. Uh, especially if you're getting into an area that has that experiences colder temps during the uh, colder sustained temps during the winter time. Also, um, average size for container trees for fruiting trees, you're probably going to start out at 10 gallons, right? You you buy this pretty little plant in the store, and it looks great, and then you bump it up to a 30 gallon container, which is not a good idea. You want to bump that up um, annually a little bit slowly or repot it slowly but i'd say your goal is to try to uh, get to a 30 gallon or more um, container and again depending on the fruit tree you're working with i think that's a, that would be a good general rule of thumb for citrus for figs uh, if you're trying to grow them in a in a container uh, does anyone have any uh, anything else you'd like to add i do yes sir. Uh, so yeah so uh, going back to lisa uh, the citrus in the pots uh, as Ginger said, you know, tw about 25 gallon container uh, would be manageable if we needed to. OK, if that if that winter storm is, is rolling across the Midwest and coming to us, 
uh, you can put that on a dolly and you can get those plants. They're not heavy enough that you can't move them into the garage for temporary um, safety. Um, and, and then roll them back out in a full sun situation and enjoy all the citrus. Uh, one thing you'd want to look for there when you're purchasing your citrus is try to find things that are on a dwarfing rootstock. Um, the plant will be labeled as a dwarf Meyer lemon or a dwarf Mexican lime, et cetera, et cetera. And this just uh, basically is that that, that scion, uh, the variety has been grafted onto a dwarfing rootstock, which for us is going to be a flying dragon trifoliate orange. And, and those are going to do much better in containers than the full size citrus are. Um, but with any of these, whether they're, they're figs, um, other small fruiting uh, dwarf trees, citrus, about every two years we would want to dislodge that plant from the container and do some root pruning. And basically that's we pull that plant out and we're going to look for any big roots that are circling in the container or gathered up around the bottom and start circling is just to take a good sharp pair of hand pruners, cut away those roots that are strangling the plant in the container and then and then repot that. If you do that every two years with those larger plants, they'll continue uh, continue to grow with vigor year after year. All right, thank you very much for that information, Boone. Folks, we thank you so much for joining us today for Gardening in the Gulf Coast. We're really delighted to be bringing this to this series to you on a monthly basis, and we thank you so much for your support and enjoying uh, these programs with us and asking the questions that you have. We do plan on another round table. It'll be in a couple more months, maybe towards the fall. In the meantime, keep abreast of our programs through your uh, local ag uh, extension uh, agent. The next program that we have coming up will be in July. It'll be July the 6th. So if you've enjoyed yourself a little bit too much during the July the 4th weekend, you can always relax and enjoy these programs that we're bringing to you at 10 o'clock uh, online. July the 6th, we'll be visiting, revisiting vegetables for summer heat. We'll be, that'll be presented by Skip Richter. He's our esteemed uh, horticulture agent in, Braz in Brazos County. That's in College Station, the mothership. So thank you to my colleagues, Boone Holiday from Fort Bend County, Ginger Easton Smith from Aransas County, Kevin Gibbs from Nueces County, and of course, uh, Yours truly from Galveston County. We thank you for your time. We look forward to serving you in the future. And of course, we'll see you in the garden. See y'all later. Have a good day. Bye. Bye, everybody.